Uh, we got uh, four verses this morning. Um, we've been assigned to talk about the earthquake in the Oak Um If I could have a reader for Matthew 28, 1 through 4. Laura, you mind reading that? Hang on, hang on a second. Let everybody get there. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 1 through 4. Uh, trying to uh, get these... Uh, uh, get through these passages without stepping on other people's material. Um, so we'll be as exhaustive as we can without doing that. So go ahead, Lord. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Hmm. So Matthew, the, in this story begins, it says after the Sabbath, uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. Um, Mark actually adds in his text another woman, Salome, which I'll let Greg identify them next week. Uh, I think possibly it might be Martha, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. It, it gets a little confusing. Um, and Mark says, uh, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome uh, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. <clears throat> uh, that's that's uh, what he what Mark says. Um, Luke says also, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. So the question in my mind arises, and I think Roger brought this up earlier when we were having this discussion, why are they Why are they anointing the body? Um, we'll look at look at that in a minute. I've already been anointed. Okay, so why? Yeah, so we'll look at that in a minute about maybe why and uh, it may, somebody may have some insights uh, other than that. Um, one of the things that came up in my study of this was um, when did Jesus die? What time of day? When? What day? When was When was it that he? He died on huh? Friday. Friday. What time Friday? Yeah. Pretty late, right? Um, Matthew in twenty Matthew twenty seven fifty seven says, as evening approached, and Roger touched on this last week, uh, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Uh, going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, placed it in his own tomb, which he cut out of the rock, rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and went away. And then listen to this on verse 61. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Um, so both women had been at the burial, uh, which more than likely was done quickly, because what was approaching on Saturday? Sabbath. What happens on the Sabbath? No worries. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing happens on the Sabbath. And, uh, you know, uh, so it's likely they were returning to finish what was started. Uh, any of you ladies ever have to go, go behind your husband and do something right? Okay. <laughs> no, 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 it wouldn't happen. But anyway, they're, they're going, I possibly believe, to uh, finish what was maybe left little rough uh, because of the Sabbath coming up. That's just conjecture. Um, I have this picture in mind of these guys hurriedly putting the spices and wrapping and, and uh, doing the barrel cloth, trying to get get it done before the Sabbath, and these ladies coming back and uh, straightening it up. I may be wrong, but that's my thought. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? How might it be different than, say, after the funeral? The grave is covered with flowers. We go back and we take the flowers. So off. it might have been just to honor to honor him. We put yeah. more flowers on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a memorial, like yeah. we see a lot today. It's a possibility. Because mm -hmm. to them he was dead. Mm -hmm. And they weren't expecting anything to grave open. Yeah. Yeah. So it that's very much a possibility. It, it, and to, just to honor him. Yeah. yeah. They didn't have the chance. 
that day. So they come back and they bring extra spices to say, yeah, we love you. There you go. Very good point. Very much possibility. So the question that comes to my mind, and I think we touched on this a little bit last week, again, where are, where are the disciples? These two guys, two guys that were secret disciples, you know, kind of undercover believers or however you want to put that. Um, they believed, but they didn't want to be known as believers. They're here doing this business. We're, man, come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like, only disciples that were actually present were the ladies, the, the lady disciples. Um, not the apostles, but the followers of Christ. I want you to consider this um, passage in Isaiah 53 for a moment. Verse 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man in his death. Because he had done no violence, he had not spoken deceitfully. Someone, what's somebody else's version say in that 50, 53 9? He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Yeah. Now think about that. When was Isaiah written, Greg? About 700 years before this. <laughs> 700 years before this event. Now, so what is it? Now apply this, think in your mind. What's it say about this event that's happening with Jesus? Mm -hmm. it was it was planned it, it had a significance more than just random okay what else what else could you say about it it is clearly a messianic prophecy <laughs> yeah and it's fulfilled right here uh, just so you know my understanding is the amount of, of spices that was brought uh by Joseph um, were, I think it was Joseph that brought them. It was extravagant. Um, and some of the part of the culture for that day was if you were a, a noble person or a person of wealth or a person that deserved honor, you got more of the spices. You had a, a, and this was beyond what even that would have been um, that was brought. Um, so verse 2 says, any other thoughts on that? Verse 2 says, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes were as white as snow. Uh, Luke's account kind of indicates there were two angels there. Um, but why the earthquake? What do you guys think? Why, why the earthquake? Kind of tell them the earth and everything. Hey, wake up. This is coming. <laughs> so wake up call. Okay, possibly, yeah. Well, any, other, any other thoughts? Why an earthquake? Earthquakes were signs of God's presence. In the, in the Old Testament, yeah. When he, he showed up, the, the, the earth shook. And, the, you know, the, um, what happened on the day of Pentecost? Is there a shaking goes on? <laughs> kind of. There's a trembling. There's a, uh, so you got this this idea that when when God shows up, you know it. Um, it's also connected with the judgment of God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's an interesting concept. Yeah, yeah, enough to put in there. Um, you know, the angels present. God's present through them and, and this earthquake shows up. Why angels? Um, angels marked import, important events in the history of God. There were witnesses in the creation, right? Um, they were witnesses to the fall of man and in fact participated in uh, keeping the man from the uh, tree of life. Uh, they were involved in the announcement to Mary at the birth, um, 
Say what? Joseph. Joseph. Yeah, they revealed those things, the, the things that were coming to Joseph and also to uh, uh, John's lost, uh, lost his name. Huh? When he, he couldn't speak and that type of thing. Uh, at the resurrection, there were witnesses uh, here, I believe, and to deliver the message. What message are they delivering? What message did these angels deliver to the disciples? And that's getting in a little bit to Greg's he lesson. Risen. He is not here. He is not here. He is risen. And that, and uh, I'll, I'll let Greg tackle that a little bit more next week. But but they were there for a purpose. Um, and I think it's very significant. So now, what was the appearance of this angel? My God. <laughs> like God, yeah. How come? Yeah, that's where we're. Yeah, the radiance. The uh, uh, Does that bring up any um, uh, recollection of a similar uh, event where there was kind of a radiance? Uh, I mean, there's several, and you've mentioned a couple. How about in the Gospels? Any kind of a how about Luke nine twenty eight. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up on the mountain to pray. And he was, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. You know, so you get this this radiance, this uh, appearance. That, yeah, yeah, this this. Yeah, this this kind of a brightness. What about when Moses comes down from the mountain? Mo had that radiance. Yeah. So what's that represent? What what does that represent? That radiance. Purity. Purity. Power of God. The power that God's present again. This you know this 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 is not something ordinary, right? This is not something ordinary. Um, yeah, and couldn't even touch the mountain. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like that scene from uh, oh, Indiana Jones when the yeah, all that kind of thing. I don't know if that's what it's like or not, but that's a pretty cool scene. Uh, the guards were so afraid of him, in verse 4 it says, that they shook and became like dead men. What, what, are, what are people's reaction to the presence of God and the angels in the, in, in the scripture? Fear. Say? Fear. 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 Yeah. Fear. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, you know, so when God shows up, it's significant, Okay. Uh, whether it's his personal presence or the presence of, of his uh, messengers and their reaction. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with um, shock. I know most of you are, you experienced it, but this is an experience of shock and all like frozen. Um, which brings me to think about um what do we do with the unexplainable? We try to explain. We try to explain it, don't we? What do you? How would these guys have tried to explain this? You know, we always think we have to know and explain and have answers for everything. I've I've been reading the book Hunting Magic Eels uh, by Richard Beck. He's a a, a professor at Abilene, um, and he makes the point that life in our culture used to center around God. There were holy days, there were hours of prayer, um, there were events that marked his presence and uh, Protestantism and kind of our movement came along and restored and minimized those in the importance of those things. Oh, you don't, you don't have to have special days, you don't have to have special, you know, all, and, and that's for good reason. However, what happens to the holiness of God when everything becomes ordinary? 
What do you do when everything becomes ordinary and God just becomes a part of the ordinary? Taking for granted. Taking him for granted. Or you know. You, you turn to psychology. Yeah. Uh, and they become the priest. Yeah. Hmm. Or, or, or science. Yeah. And so, you guys remember blue laws? What were the blue laws? Somebody tell those. I think everybody probably knows it. What? You remember that? Yeah. What could you do on Sunday? Go to church. Go to church. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it. When? What was the first thing that started opening up? Was it restaurants? I think that was it because everybody wanted to eat out after after church. Huh? After a little bit after that, you could go shopping at Penny's. You know that kind of thing. And slowly, what happened to Sunday? Just an ordinary day. And so, yeah. And so you see, you see, when we when we create uh, an ordinary an ordinariness around God, um, we create problems. Now, our world. What's our world centered around now? Entertainment. Our Next cars. thing to do ourselves. Our um, he says in, in this book, he says we live in a skeptical and disenchanted world. I like that word, disenchanted. It's like nothing, nothing special. Everything's ordinary. Um, what does that do to hallowed be thy name? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed. What's that word mean? Holy. Set apart. Different. Not separate from us, not distant, but different. Holy. Um, Enchanted, you might say. Yeah. When God becomes common, we become our own God. It's kind of an argument for Sabbath. Yeah. 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 Special day. What happened to our Sabbath? You know, what happened to the day set apart for God? If I could explain or understand all there is to know about God, would he be God? I mean, I, I grew up wanting to know everything about God and we had kind of, we thought we had God kind of cornered and knew everything about him. I'm discovering there's a lot I don't know about God. I discover something every day, you know, and, and you know, if you, uh, when we think we have God in a box, he's no longer God. Um, he's in our box. Hmm? He's in our box. That's what I mean. Yeah, when you... Inside, that's what oh, I guess. As a spirit. So, we should know the power that's within us. But, you know, hmm. you're right in the What gives your life purpose and meaning? Hmm? God. God. Okay. Because without him, you know, what hope do hmm? Without him, what hope do you have? Yeah. You know, we're. Entertainment is not going to satisfy you after a while. Yeah. I, I think that might be what hap what's happening in our culture. People have lost the other something bigger than themselves. And when I become just myself, what do I have hope for? I mean, everybody with me on that? You hear what I'm saying? You know, we, we got to get back to the mystery of God. Um, there's a, everybody familiar with Viktor Frankl? He's a psychiatrist and that survived a Nazi death camp. Uh, he was Jewish and was, was, I think, I can't remember the camp he was sent to. But he wrote a book uh, It's still, if you're a, uh, any kind of a psychology field and had read that book, you'd be like, what, you haven't read that? It's Man's Search for Meaning. <clears throat> and he said, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Let that simmer a little bit. Those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Why do you live? To 
the glorified God. Okay, so you know we got this. Got to get this understanding. Uh, we don't have an explanation for everything. Uh, when we understand our lives matter in the larger scheme of things uh, more than we can imagine, then we understand life. When our world loses this, we don't want to be around. <laughs> because when our world loses this, it's going to be chaos. So what do you do with the unexplainable? If you take all the miraculous out of the Christian faith, what do you have? Cute little story <laughs> um, about a nice old man. Somebody said, oh, old man, a nice old man that lives up in the sky. But we live in a secular world that questions everything and wants an explanation for unexplainable things. <clears throat> We're given the command by God to subdue our earth, and there's nothing wrong with looking for answers. You know, we don't need to slam science. People are looking for answers. If, you know, they're, they're actually looking for answers. But you believe... But if you believe you have come to a place in life where everything is, is explainable and you reject things that cannot be explained, what kind of place is that? If I think I can explain everything and nothing's unexplainable, what's left? Yeah, faith is gone. The mystery's gone. Um, I got the, got the God to define and boxed in. So in our text today, the angel of the Lord arrives to roll away the stone. He's dazzling white, arrives with such power that the earth shakes. Wouldn't you like to have seen that? Maybe not. <laughs> I might have been dead on arrival. I don't know. But, you know, just get that picture in your mind. Sometimes we, we skip over these things like they're normal, like they're, like they're ordinary. Get that picture in your mind that's and the, the earthquake and the flash and the, you know, I can't even imagine it. That's the point. Um, was that earthquake just in the tomb or was it all over everywhere? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. But I'm just kind of, it, it's not a typical occurrence. Who, who were the soldiers? What, do, what kind of experiences did Roman soldiers have? I want you to think a picture in your mind. Uh, how many of you guys seen that, have seen the show uh, with the SEAL team? It's on TV and all that kind of picture of picture of Navy SEAL, battle worn, seen everything, been through all kind of stuff. That's what I picture when I picture these soldiers and their reaction of shock means. I don't know what my reaction would have been because <laughs> they've seen some stuff, right? More, you know, um, it's not a typical occurrence because these guys are frozen. Uh, when the body reacts to trauma, it's fight, flight, freeze, fawn, or dissociate. I don't know if you ever heard those or not, but if you ever want to know more about them, I'll tell you, that's not our point today. But what's interesting about our age and time is we claim that all the unexplainable things of the past are insignificant. Well, what's most of our entertainment about? Fantasy, the unexplainable. You know, uh, you all, I don't know, sometimes you get into these series and like, whoa, what's going to happen next? And it, it's all these just unexplainable, crazy things and our kids are soaking that stuff up. Why? I think there's a vacuum of the mystery of God, that people are just soaking up all this other stuff because they don't have the reality. Does that make sense? If we don't have God, we create, we create some kind of uh, fantasy, <laughs> some kind of unexplainable. Uh, so here's the question that I want to propose to you, loaded question. Do you believe in miracles? Okay. Do you believe angels exist? have authority in our world how about demons yes. do we live like we believe those things or or have we absorbed the culture's understanding that everything's explainable and everything has an answer and man my fear is 
that we have. Um, somebody read Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. And then uh, somebody, who, who am I doing that? Bill, you mind doing that? Can you get, you don't have to work, hurry there because we're going to come in a minute. Bill, you mind six, six, ten through twelve in a minute. And then I need somebody else to do Second uh, Corinthians four sixteen through eighteen. Do my mind doing that? Greg got that one. Oh, somebody said David. Is that you, David? Is that you, David? Yeah, I can do Second Corinthians. Okay, yeah, David will get that one. Okay, so we got Ephesians six. 10 through 12, and then David will do um, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So, Bill, go ahead. So have to be strong in the Lord and any part of God. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly realms. Now, let me ask you a question before we get to David's reading. If we believe just that text, if we fully believe just that text, how would our life be different? How would our life be different? If we put our, if we put full trust in this, this just this passage, we spend much more time in prayer. How come? Because we need God to have a sight for evil. More time in prayer, less focused on our ability. Right? What else? What else would be different? <coughs> Say it again. He's got this right. Yeah, you know, we're children of God. We get, we got somebody fighting our battle. You know, we, uh, we <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but man, I think I want to do away with tweeting and all that stuff because everywhere you turn, oh, there's a new uh, pandemic, new part of the pandemic coming. Oh, there's a new um, a wave of uh, a mosquitoes coming that's going to infect the world. With you know, come on, <laughs> he's got this. I mean, you know. You got to have some some sense and judgment and that type of thing, but he's got this. Uh, you know, I, I don't want I, I don't want to tell Josh's story, but he's got faith, man. And you know, I just even in the midst of all this, he's got this. You know, so I'll let him tell his story. I, I don't like telling other people's stories, but you know, when you when you think about. Um, and again, going back to a point you made earlier, explaining everything. We explain things that we see psychological mess ups. We don't want to talk about that demon yeah. part of it. Yeah. Leave that part out that there's some there could be some evil evil suggestions. <sighs> yeah. I think there's power in acknowledging evil and those sort of things. But I also think we need to recognize we don't have to be able to explain it. There you go. But there's power in knowing it exists, recognizing it, and like Lynn said, pointing to God, knowing that's where we're going to get the power to fight this. Awesome and I'm not in the position to understand what Greg is saying about the, the, the evil, evil influence and, and all the things. I'm not in a position to understand all those things. I have some understanding about what makes the mind work and all that kind of thing, but I'm not God. I don't know which one's evil and which one's not. And I know for a fact not everything that happens is evil, but it's just, you know, uh, the Christian scientist kind of went down that road about um, uh, everything physically has an evil component and, you know, you, you just don't believe it and it'll go away. <laughs> yeah, I'm not so sure that happens, but it, if it did, it'd be awesome. But, you know, so... Uh, but there's a balance in understanding as a person of faith. This could be, who knows what maybe Josh was getting ready to 
burst loose with some kind of, and somebody's trying to take him out. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I'm not God. I, but you know, just we we had to have our mind um, into the mystery, if that goes. And I, and I don't understand everything. David, go ahead and read Second uh, Corinthians four sixteen through eighteen. Did I lose you, Dave? Did I lose you, Dave? You ready, Mike? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I want to focus on that last Verse 18, uh, my, we fix our eyes on things that are what? Huh? Yeah. Not on what is seen, but what? <coughs> unseen. The unseen things, the mystery, the things we don't understand. Those are the things that we need to ramp up and, and, and declare that God has this in his realm. Does that make sense to you guys? You know, I, I can't figure out COVID. I can't figure out, you know, and the guys that think they know it, I'm not sure they even know. <laughs> yeah, it just, it's just so crazy, all the stuff that's going on. But I know somebody does know, okay? And when I trust him, is that making sense? Making, okay. So our focus should not be on our natural world in our existence, but focused on what is obscured from sight, seeing with the eyes of faith that God is alive and powerful. He's got this. What does that do to you when you when you believe that? You, I think you mentioned it. I, you don't worry. What 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 is there to worry about? That's easier said than done. By the way, at least it is for for me. I say don't worry, and then I'm worry about not worrying <laughs> but anyway so you so you but that is a comfort it's i don't have to control everything i don't have to know everything i don't have to have all the answers um <laughs> the scriptures is our key and when we stop doing that then we're no we're complacent and take for granted the power of god and so that's where we have that Goodness of stimulus, even though we don't always get answers. It's a willingness to search and, and develop ourselves uh, in terms of uh, understanding. But can I understand fully everything about scripture? No. You know, that's part of the even that's part of the mystery. You feel communicate and understand everything, but it's okay to question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's not doubt. We keep wrestling. We keep because we're always struggling with it. To fight Satan and learn more about the power of God and trust in Him. Yeah. Yeah, I think in, in, in my experience as, as a younger person, um, I got the impression that, and maybe it was a wrong impression, but I got, I got the impression that folks at my church had it all figured out. They knew all the answers, they knew all the scriptures, they knew everything about the scriptures. And, you know, uh, um, somehow I didn't, but they did, you know, and, and so all I needed to do was get the right answers and I'm still got questions. Anybody else still have questions? Yeah, and I think that's part of the mystery that we don't have to know everything. We don't have to understand everything perfectly and 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 we wrestle with this mystery of God. And I can't put him in a box. A big a big help to that is Isaiah 55 verse 8. Yeah, go ahead. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Nor are uh, your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than So them. how in the world could we ever understand everything about God? You know, the, the creation of all of this, there's, so, there's been so much from the time that we've driven from the garden, all, everything that we were cursed with, which we are still going through. Mm. That I, I can't help but when you get to Revelation 21, uh, verse 
Yeah. Somebody hold that Bible up for Chris. <laughs> And the of the songs, now the dwelling of God is with men, and they will be his peace for mm-hmm. the self to be with them, and neither God. That's when we'll know it. Yeah. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Yes, absolutely. What was the, what was the temptation for Adam and Eve? To be God. To be like God. You know, maybe that's our temptation. That we want to fully understand God. I mean, um, you can't. We want to be God. Be God. Yeah, we want to control our world like God. Yeah, we want to take over the world. Uh, what was that Pinky in the brain? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take over the world. Uh, if y'all don't know that, I'm sorry. Our kids used to watch that all the time. I want to end with this uh, just thought. And I don't have the answer as much as you think about it. Uh, Luke 9, 37. I'll read the scripture for you. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he's only, my only child. A spirit seizes, seizes him, and he, he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him, and he's destroying him. I beg your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. And this is Jesus' reply. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back life, life loud to his father. And all were amazed at the greatness of God. Here's my question. If Jesus considered their world an unbelieving perverse generation what would you say about ours let's embrace the mystery of God <laughs> let's just say and I'll say I'll tell you right now if you don't want to confess I, will, I don't know everything about God and I'm not going to know everything about God but I trust him okay. let's pray God thank you for the life and the mystery of life we don't understand how breath we know that people say breath enters our mouth and oxygen goes to our bloodstream and makes our body work, but we don't understand the mystery of all that. I don't think anybody does. There are things about our life and our mystery and our world that we don't understand, but you know. We trust you. We believe in you. We, we hold you uh, to be our, our God, our faithful and trusting friend. It's through Christ I pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. My Appreciate it online, folks. We don't know everything about God, but we come to a point where we recognize His presence. Yeah, you know Him a little better. The story of Josh, God was saved. And that was the first thing I thought of whenever, as a matter of fact, I had a conversation with someone that was saying, and it was just, you just realize God's here, He's got this. I guess when we're younger, I think we um, think, oh, he was lucky. Or, oh, that was just the providence. That's what I was talking about. We don't embrace, embrace the mystery of what God's doing. But you, you know, with age and the desire to know God better, I think it comes at, oh, well, he's here. <laughs> you know, no doubt. And you realize that, how he worked, I don't know. But he was there. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.